Uh, where are you based? Are you in London? No, I'm in uh, uh, just outside a place called Henlow in Hertfordshire. Uh, okay. Uh, I did, yeah, no one really knows where it is. <laughs> it, it, it is. It does exist. Yeah, fair. Hertfordshire always sounds nice for some reason. Yeah. Actually, yeah. no, what are talking about? It's Bedfordshire. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Literally on the border. So, and I was living in Hertfordshire uh, until recently. But uh, yeah, Bedfordshire. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. I assume you lived in London for a fair bit, though. I did, yeah. I lived there until about 2015, 2014, something like that. Um, okay. It's one of those things I think you're when you first move to London, you kind of fall in love with it and then and then it's like a kind of abusive girlfriend for a or boyfriend for, <laughs> for the entirety of the time you're there. But it was for me anyway. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like I was there for about five years, but then moved the pair to Manchester. But I do miss it a bit to be fair, but it's it's well, I find it weird going there now. And I don't know if it's, you know, just uh, sounding like an old man or something, but it, it's a bit like going to a theme park now. It's like London land. <laughs> it's not really, well, it's definitely not as as real, uh, if, you, if you'll if excuse the expression, as, as, you know, when I was living there. And I don't mean that, you know, oh, it's not dangerous or anything like that. It's just, it's just everything so kind of sanitised and homogenised and Starbuckized and, and everything. It's just, yeah. Uh, it's kind of lost the, lost its soul a little bit. But. Yeah, I know. What you mean, I kind of feel like I moved down there in 2015, so I kind of missed out on, especially this like this era I talk about a lot, where it sounded yeah. so exciting in, in the early 2000s to be down there. But yeah, nice little segue there. Yeah, you've, <laughs> you've done this before. <laughs> so I was interested. Um, I went on the Snap Galleries website. Yeah, and they had like a. A great little bio. So I just wanted to read that out because it's a good introduction, really. He says, uh, Roger Sargent was born in London in 1970 to a maverick English teacher mother and a father who filmed TV classics, The Professionals and Minder. Casting shadows further, casting shadows further, one grand- grandfather was the clapper boy on Hitchcock's The 39 Steps, the other invented the police siren. Roger's transient childhood took place in Somerset and South Africa with a brief break in Gwent along the way. So, yeah. good starting point, I guess. Sounds like you had it in your blood a bit of it. A little bit, yeah. Um, although my dad always said, "Don't go into it. Don't go into photography or video or anything like that," because um, you get treated like shit and they pay you badly. And he was right, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you just can't, you know. Maybe it's funny. Like my son, my son's twelve now, and he, I. I, I've not actively discouraged him, but um, he's really into photography and video now. And um, every time, like someone's on telly or some, we hear a record, I say, "Oh, I've worked with them," and he's like, "Oh, that's amazing! See, it's really good doing what you did, isn't it?" And it's like, "Well, yeah, I suppose." <laughs> Do you think it's maybe even harder now for to start? I mean, if start? I was, it's funny. I still get lots of people emailing me, either asking for advice or for assisting work or things like that. I mean, I, I can see. I'm not. I'm not. Um, com, you know, by any means, out of touch with um, how one might do that now. But it's definitely harder. It's definitely. Um, there's. Def- it's a bit like the same. It's. It's not dissimilar to way it is the way it is for bands. There's no labels anymore, so you have to kind of do it all yourself. And it's the same with with photography and video. You kind of have to do it all yourself. You have to be a. Um, you have to promote yourself. Um, uh, and in my, you know, I mean, looking back, at, you know, I was looking, I was t- talking to someone the other day about one year I, I went to America, like I went to New York, sorry, 11 times in one year. And, um, and that, and that wasn't, that they weren't the only foreign trips I did. There's nothing like that now in terms of magazines and things, you know, that will send you on assignments like that. And that's just, that's a real shame. I'm not sure what we've got instead is, a great replacement either yeah. yeah yeah i mean we'll get into all that i guess but um it would be remiss of me not to ask about your granddad inventing the police Aaron. that's a good fact to have in it yeah it's the it was the only way that i could breeze over the fact that he worked for gchq so there's a lot of stuff i can't maybe say that about what he did but he was right. he was involved with a lot of things um after the war um like nuclear um, early warning systems and things like that. 
Okay, right. Quite a, quite a character. Yeah, yeah. And what does it mean by maverick English teacher mother? Well, my, my mom, who's no longer with us anymore, but um, she, um, yeah, she definitely never did anything by the book. <laughs> um, I remember one time when, when, when I was about 14, she was working in a, <clears throat> in a sort of private school in Johannesburg and she wanted to prove to the people that owned it that their security systems were lax. So she went in in the middle of the night with um, my then stepfather and stole all the computers. <laughs> wow okay yeah so it definitely proved the point <laughs> yeah i was gonna say yeah. um yeah what was that like then so somerset south africa quite a big experience as a, as a child yeah it was um south africa was definitely one of those places at the time that that was um you know uh it couldn't help but you know form you know be formative in your formative years it was i was there in you know around 80 83 to 87 so it was during this the worst time of times of apartheid um there was a state of emergency declared not be, not because i arrived but as as i arrived there was a state of emergency declared and and if anyone in, who recently come over from britain you, you know you knew that <clears throat> what the, what was being shown on the television wasn't a true um, representation of what was actually going on in the in, in the country itself. So it was kind of a weird place to be, you know, politically and uh, and so on. It, I mean, it, it had a different different effects on different people. Some people it, it kind of ra radicalized them, uh, you know, in a in a socialist way, which is kind of the way that I became. And some people, you know, they went the other way. Unfortunately, right? Yeah, I mean. I imagine that would be quite a good place to start taking photographs with. Were you old enough to have a camera and stuff? <laughs> Only in a in a very passive way. I, you know, that's when I did start taking pictures, but it was it was mainly like the family stuff. Like I was always the one that was taking the taking pictures uh, on when we were on holiday and stuff. But I, but already mu like musically, because really most of the people, most of my friends hated being there. And and sort of hated the environment, and um, you know, for ver for various obvious reasons. So we identify very much with Britain and British music and stuff like that. So uh, I was buying the NME when I was out there, and it was the equivalent of a month's pocket money to get wow. to get the NME because because it, it was you know anything like that was banned, so it was kind of imported like like a grey import, I guess. So it was really expensive. Likewise, any kind of clothes like. Doc Martens and things like that were ludicrously expensive. Um, but nevertheless, like, yeah, we so we'd get like an enemy and share it around. And and that's how we kind of kept in touch with what was going on and smash hits and stuff like that, to, you know. Um, but yeah, that was a bit of a lifeline, definitely. Yeah, fair. So how old were you at that point then? I was um, sort of between the age of 14 and 18. Okay. Right. So yeah. Proper formative years. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. So who was influencing your music taste up to that point then? Or what was kind of thing? Um, God, I listened to lots of different things from The Smiths, Madness, right up to Crass, Conflict, um, Rudimentary Penide. Um, I got very into kind of uh, left-wing, left-field punk rock music, especially more so when I got back to the UK as well. Um, but yeah, just anything really that identified with where, where we'd come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was interested uh, about the Rodriguez story as well. Like, was do you remember Rodriguez being a big deal in South Africa at that point? Yeah? Not at the, not at the time. I okay, think. right. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't still haven't seen that film. Um, but yeah. I'd, I mean, I can only remember a few bands that were famous. I mean, most of the, this wouldn't include him, but most of the stuff out there, like it was a cultural cesspit. So, um, you know, because you never got any 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 indigenous music. It was just kind of white Africana music. That was this, that was the, and that, that was fucking terrible. <laughs> Fair play, yeah. So yeah, you mentioned going back to the UK then, and you ended up on um, the uh, a course with a renowned documentary photographer called david hearn is that yeah. right 
Yeah. So yeah. how did that come around? Um, I originally started doing photography as a as an elective at Sixth Form College, and it was really because I think the the only other options were things that involved getting really cold and muddy in the in in the winter, and that didn't didn't strike me as much fun. So, and they were talking about lots of darkroom work and things like that. So I thought that would be nice and warm, and um, and I was in I was in Derbyshire at the time. I, um, and I eventually kind of used it as a way to get into gigs because I'd sort of give people photographs and so on. And I built up a bit of a portfolio of work. And there were a few of us that were applying to this uh, this college in Newport. And it was re- back then it was renowned as like the sort of best in the country or the best in the world or whatever. Um, and a friend of mine went for his interview the day before I, I did. And it, when, when I spoke to him and got back, he just went, you've got absolutely no chance of getting in. There's just no way, no way. It's really hard. And um, so I kind of went without any nerves at all and um, just just went on about all the bands that I loved and and taking pictures of them and all this sort of stuff. And they, they yeah, for whatever reason, they uh, they, they let me in. <laughs> yes. And what was it like working? Were you working directly with David Hearn then? He, by that stage, he was he was more like a, a visiting lecturer. He was still running the course, but he he wasn't the head of the the course anymore so it was Daniel Meadows and Clive Landon were the heads then who were equally fantastic I mean it was an incredible incredible um course to do it was really intensive you know so we would be out shooting from nine in the morning till six you know six seven eight nine at night um the camaraderie was amazing it the you know the first half of the course was pretty much um getting you to learn the skills of taking pictures rather than you know st- you know the art of taking photos because they, their ethos was that you know if you if you're not in command of your your tools or the tools of your trade then it's going to get in the way of what you do so you need to be really good at, at com- uh, composing and and getting the right moment and things like that and um so we would just go we'd go out shoot you know maybe someone hammering a nail into a piece of wood come back then we'd we'd get a one-to-one critique and if you did if you got it wrong if you didn't get it quite you know 100 you'd be back out and you'd have to go to that same person homer in the nail in a bit of wood maybe four five six seven eight nine times you know and and it definitely gets uh gets gets rid of those cobwebs definitely yeah is it, is it like quite hard and fast rules then when it comes to photography like quite strict guidelines to follow sometimes it's not it's not so much that it's just it's just if you're if you walk into a situation and you're fiddling with your camera and you don't know what you're doing you're missing stuff immediately um and if you they had their the um they had lots of sort of catchphrases but one of them was if if it's not good enough you're not close enough and um and that can you know that can me that can work on on a couple of levels but essentially you know you need to be familiar with what you're doing um and not be afraid of it and that that sort that kind of those kind of um watchwords stayed stayed with me forever really you already had you already had a bit of an insight to like filmmaking with your dad anyway kind of thing a little bit yeah um but i mean he you know he did he did mostly drama and then news um my granddad did um did yeah pretty much the same things at the bbc but uh i didn't know i didn't really know my granddad or i didn't really know my dad till i was about 11 or 12 anyway and so whereas you might be getting constant um sort of you know uh i don't know what the word is really but you where whereas you might be guided by your parents um living in a completely different country to my dad you know i kind of missed out on quite a lot of that right okay yeah sporadic right and then yeah it says something like you nearly dropped out of that course to go on the road with a band called the fabulous who's made up of uh enemy journalists and porn stars is that right pretty much yeah (laughs) any stories there (laughs) <laughs> yeah uh very unclean ones <laughs> um 
Yeah, no, but it, it so Simon Dudfield or Simon Spence, as he is now known, uh, was the lead singer of the band. Um, he's like a world round author now. He's written books on the Rolling Stones and um, loads of other people. Martin Goodacre was <clears throat> the uh, was the guitarist. He um, he took probably the most famous picture of Kurt Cobain, uh, the one that was on the NME cover when Kurt died. Um, and James Brown was the manager, and he went on to do Loaded and. Um, uh, oh yeah, I know what you mean yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a great little uh, hot house environment for creativity in that respect, and um, and they would live in the dream in terms of they you know they'd seen how how badly people in rock and roll behave, and so then they, they'd been taking notes clearly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, sounds it to be fair. And then, yeah, it says on graduating, you had um, brief spells at Melody Maker and Idea Magazine. And I mean, when it comes to the bands you've uh, photographed, it's like a who's who, so it's hard to know where to start, I guess. But what are your early memories of like those first first bands you were, you were taking photos of? I mean, mostly it was it was live photography at the beginning. You had to it was almost like doing an apprenticeship. Um, and I went to Enemy first, then, Mel then Melody Maker. And Ed Melody Maker gave me my first gigs. And uh, weirdly, I think, um, I think Rage Against the Machine might have been the first one of the first gigs I did for Melody Maker, which is insane. It was at the Underworld, um, and it was only half full. Wow. I, was, I was mad. Um, it was really just like trying to do anything to get in there, you know. So I, I would get, I would get photo passes from from um the band's prs and management and stuff like that and just uh, you know as well as getting commissions i would just go out and shoot bands and give them to the enemy in, in the hope that they would notice me um so initially like i said yeah i was working at melody maker for a while and then um there came a point with enemy where i said look i'd rather be working for you but you need to give me more work and they and they they said yeah right well let's let's do it if i'm honest like early on i only really wanted to photograph nirvana and um screaming trees and bands like that but it you know there was such a hierarchy at the enemy it was really difficult to get anywhere near any bands like that so the only thing that you could do is really get in with bands at the at a ground level that and inevitably it had to be bands that you love so so i was working with bands like john spencer blues explosion and um a lot of the kind of left field American music that no one else, like Green Day and another band that no, that no one else had really heard of. And um, you get to photograph them to a certain level and then, the, you know, the the old guard at the enemy, they would take over and it was really soul destroying until I became the old guard at enemy. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was quite right. <laughs> yeah, fair. So how would you hear about these bands then to get on like the ground level type thing? Um. I guess the same way that I always used to hear about music and that was like listening to John Peel and um, and going to record stores and, you know, buying buying random records because I'd, I knew the label or I'd read a review or something like that. It was, um, I know it's it's a lot easier to find stuff and I do avail myself of the, of you know, in Instagram and, and um, Facebook and stuff to, to discover new bands, but it was quite exciting you know, buying a record that you'd never heard a note of and finding out if it was any good. It wasn't always any good. <laughs> <laughs> so then how would you guarantee you'd be able to take photos and we just would you go under the enemy's name or would you just, just go as a freelance type thing? Uh, you could, I mean, it, after a while I was just getting commissions, so I, it, was, it was in the enemy's name. And then you'd meet people, um, if you were doing a trip, you know, say to Portsmouth or Brighton or whatever, you'd often be with a PR and you get talking to them and then and um and they'd say, Oh, we've got this other band if you fancy taking photos for them. And then so you'd get to do, you know, more sort of posed stuff, portrait stuff, and and just gradually kind of widen a network of um uh, friends and colleagues and things like that. And and yeah, you know, hopefully do good work and get re-employed. Uh, uh, you know again and again yeah yeah and 
with Nirvana, then what what your memories of uh, of watching them type thing? <sighs> yeah, it's a bit of a sore point that one. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it was. If I'm, I'm pretty sure it was either the day the day of my birthday or the day after my birthday. I can't remember now, but um, so it was the only time I got to see them. I missed them about three times before that, and it was at the Roseland Ballroom in in uh, New York, and I was with a with enemy and we would i was with a writer and we were doing a piece on the whole the whole thing so that you know we had we'd go and see four or five bands in the night and i was like oh. I, I think i'd got into to to, to the pit and it was cr- the, one of the craziest shows i've done there's literally just bodies coming over every five seconds get, you know you're getting kicked in the back of the head you can barely hold the camera up straight half the time but it was great and um and then I got out of the pit and met up with the journalist and I said, and um, he said, oh, we've got to go and see another band. I was like, oh, come on. This is like the first time I've ever got to see Nirvana. It's my birthday, as far as I was concerned. And um, no, so we had to go and see Juliana Hatfield, uh, who was great and everything, but it literally played at an empty venue right. somewhere else in New York. And how, I, many, how many songs did you have to leave after with Nirvana? It was about six, maybe oh, eight, yeah. something like that. So I got to see a few, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't ideal. Yeah, and what year was that? Um, ninety four. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. really, like that kind of massive period, obviously. Yeah, I mean that that Roseland show apparently is legendary now. Uh, there's clips online, and stuff like that. It's the one where he was wearing that that black and red jumper. Um. But yeah, a bit gutted. Yeah, fair enough. Um, at least you saw on there. <laughs> and then I saw you did an exhibition of Oasis, so I'm guessing you must have started taking photos of them fairly early. Yeah, I did the first London show. I'm pretty. I, I think it was the last, first London show. Anyway, when they played the Water Rats, um, it was like a showcase gig for the Creation put on, <laughs> and I got a picture of. Uh, I just, you know, partly being in the right place, you know, I got a picture of Liam looking right into the camera that they ended up using for adverts and stuff when um, uh, Supersonic came out and sort of grew a relationship with creation. I ended up being, um, this sounds a bit more exciting than it was, but ended up being their um, in-house photographer um, brackets with the exception of oasis <laughs> um although i did get to shoot them a lot more because of that because of doing that um and yeah got to go to a hell of a lot of oasis shows and and um don't remember many of them <laughs> yeah so on instagram big scott energy was asking how many times have you seen oasis live and when was the first time so we've covered the first time but just saying a lot of times you saw them basically yeah. I really couldn't say how many. I mean, probably if I sat down, but I'm guessing in the in the region of fifty. Wow, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Because a lot of the, you know they do like three nights in a row, and I'd be be there for all of those. And yeah, because if you had a bit of a relationship with with a band, they enemy would tend to send you to do that band, especially if they were difficult, which Oasis often were. Um, yeah, they'd send people that had a bit of a relationship, so that helped. Yeah, fair. And were you big into them in general and in, in terms of the music? Yeah, 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 definitely. It was, I mean, it definitely felt like there was something going on, you know, and and um, and I'd been, it, it, what I was going to say actually earlier was that up until then, up until kind of new wave of new wave, I don't know if you know what, what that was or when that was, but it was just before Britpop it, and there were, it, so it was like a sort of proto Britpop movement that never really went anywhere. But it, but if it hadn't happened, it, Britpop may not have happened. But up until then, it, it was pretty fucking diabolical. Uh, <laughs> yeah, apart from some of the American bands, it was just dire. So when when um, Britpop, for want of a better word, came along, it was it was nice to be part of something exciting again. Yeah, and how do you feel like? Britpop, Britpop compares to what was going on in the early 2000s. Is there any like notable differences, do you think? 
it, yeah, it's weird being like kind of being part of both times or being you know involved in both times. I'd say that the early two thousands was it definitely it it definitely felt kind of grittier and less um, less organised by labels and things like that. You know, there was the labels jumped on bands in in um, in the Britpop days, and they were all trying to get their ne the next Oasis. Whereas I think they were a little bit terrified of bands like the Libertine. So, <laughs> so it wasn't really the same kind of reaction, and it it definitely felt earthier. If yeah, that's a that's a kind way of saying it, I suppose. I mean, the drugs yeah. the drugs were kind of nastier, and um, you know, it was like Britpop was very much. I mean, there was a bit of smack and stuff around, but it was it was basically cocaine. But in the early thousands, it was crack, heroin, and cocaine. It was, and it was all the kids doing it as well, and that wasn't nice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Libertines, and obviously, taking many iconic photos of them. Like, what are your early memories of uh, being around them, kind of thing, or how did you first hear about them? First heard about them. I'd, I'd moved out of London. I, I one of the many times that I'd considered quitting the business, and um, I'd moved out of London, and a friend of mine who was there press officer said look I've got this but I'm just I think I'm going to be working with this really good band come and see them and um I was like oh fuck, all right so I, I I would live quite far out so I drove in like about an hour and a half drove into London uh, to the to Cherry Jam where they were playing and they, I don't think they'd been signed yet they were just about to be signed and um it was exciting that, you know it was genuinely it was really shambolic but it was really exciting and a little bit frightening which is kind of ticks boxes for me with bands yeah, yeah. so i kind of jumped on the the roller coaster for, and just just to, to see where it went you know <laughs> yeah i mean it seems like you were there throughout the whole journey really yeah. um so it's interesting to get your take on things um like how quickly did things get a bit fraught and a bit dark do you think I say it was really good, positive. Well, it seemed to me anyway, really good, positive fun until the first up the bracket tour. And um, I remember we were coming back from God. I, I mean, I, you you may know better than me on this, but um, I'm pretty sure we were coming up from Birmingham, Manchester, and Peter just got off the bus, and he was supposed to get back on and didn't, and then nobody saw him again, and um, that just seemed odd to me um above and beyond you know wanting to make you know wanting to do drugs or anything like that i think looking back now it's it's easy to see in hindsight but i think it was it was probably like a mental health issue really you know because i know that i know now that he gets really um uh, really stressed about shows and i think if there are too many shows in a row it's not good for him I think it's probably you know like most of the things in our, in our lives when if that's the way you are when you're younger it's probably going to be the same when it's probably going to be true when you're older as well so I think it's um I think it's probably that I think the drugs were a crutch for that more than anything else hmm. and you say like you're traveling with them and stuff um so I guess you know I've talked to other photographers who said it's no, a lot, a lot, a lot of it's about building relationships with bands and people. Were you able to like, I don't know, build a good relationship with them from the off type thing? Pretty much, yeah. Um, there was a bit, of, there was a bit of a kind of baptism of fire initially. You know, we'd go out quite a lot in London, and I'd end up back at the Albion Ruins, and um, I was a bit older than them, but but they. Um, you know, they they kind of treated me like one of one of the gang, you know. And it was, yeah, there was a bit of kind of one upmanship all the time, you know, about staying up. Oh no, you've got to come out. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to stay out late. Uh, um, yeah, almost like a kind of uh, initiation into a gang. Did it in your past with flying colours type thing? Yeah, I've never been known to let people down in that department. <laughs> and then I was interested in the Future Legends exhibition you did. Was that a yeah. kind of thing around uh, quite a few bands of that time? 
so yeah that was after the the, the liberty was exhibition that i did um proud were keen to do something else that um after the success of the the uh the libs exhibition because the libs exhibition had, it was only on for three days they didn't think proud didn't really want to do it so they gave me the so in between exhibitions they have a three-day um change over time so they break everything down start putting the next one up and they said you can have the the the, the space in between two exhibitions to do your libertines exhibition and um it sounds really bragging but it's it's true they had more people through the door in those three days than they'd ever had for any other exhibition that they'd ever done. So they were quite keen to, to do something else. Um, and I thought the, the, the kind of best thing, and this is kind of going back to where I'd come from at university, or college, sorry, because it wasn't a university, would be to do, to do almost like a survey. It sounds boring if I put it like that, but almost like a survey of the, of the bands that were around at the time and um you know not all of them ended up as future legends obviously but it was just to kind of encapsulate what was going on at the uh, at the at that moment because it yeah, was yeah. yeah i saw your caption on one of the was it photo with block party you said that you kind of uh almost demanded to take photos of them because you thought they were going to be great kind of type of thing yeah yeah, I, I just heard one one single. That was the thing. There were so many great bands putting out great records. Some of them only ever put out one great record, but but it was uh, it didn't feel like they were all trying to copy each other's sound either. Off a website anymore or something? Not at the moment. No, I, I've I've kind of let everything lapse because I during COVID I decided to study. Okay, and that's kind of what I've been doing for the last three years. Um, so I've just kind of let everything lapse. So I've just got my Instagram, which I've just literally in the last few days started, the last two weeks started working again. Um, just it's, it's weird. I've, I have did a couple of shoots recently and I um, kind of starting to fall in love with, with photography again because I, had, I hadn't really done a lot of photography in the last 10, 15 years. But going through my old stuff and, and um, yeah, it's kind of reinvigorated me a little bit. I'm not sure where I'm going to go afterwards and how much work I'll I'll choose to do. Um, I'll just see where it goes. It's really easy to burn out doing this sort of thing because you'll do one good shoot and then you'll get asked to photograph another band, you know, four people, four blokes, you know, and then another band, four blokes, another band, four blokes, and it starts to get incredibly monotonous. Um, and I don't have the longest attention span in the world. So I, you know, that's why I've ended up managing bands. I've had a record label. I've, um, you know, now I'm studying. I, I just can't my, mentally keep still. So uh, here we are. <laughs> uh, what have you been studying out of interest then? Psychology. By? Psychology. Psychology, right. Okay. That's interesting. Is that something you've always been interested in then? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a, a, a fair amount since my son was born. My son has autism. So um, there's an element to that. But yeah, I've always been, I've always been really fascinated. And um, yeah, lockdown seemed like a really good opportunity to, to take a look at that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually going through early stages of that with my little boy. He's um. Neuro, we know he's neurodivergent to some degree, but we're trying to kind of like trying to get all the help in place before he starts school. It's a bit of a learning yeah, care for us as well. Yeah, it's tricky because you you don't always get the the help that you need at schools and things like that. And yeah, you're right to get it in place as early as possible. It took us five years to get oh, it because wow, okay. because he's very high functioning. So, um, but that doesn't always mean that everything's you know. Uh, um, happy go lucky, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's certainly few few ups and downs. Yeah. Um, okay. Like if you look at like cover cover photographs, then um, yeah. just interested because obviously you've done some iconic Libertines ones, and I was reading one you did with Fat Boy Slim. Maybe it wasn't a cover photo, but somewhere you, you get direction. 
Okay, right. Somewhere you'd get like a lot of um, direction, and I imagine with Liberty, it's more down to you, maybe. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, with with them, it was it was it was such a victory just to get the four of them in the same place for any any stretch of time. I mean, even the first session we did, Peter and Cole turned up like two hours late. The, actually, no, the first session we did, they turned up five or six hours late to their own house, <laughs> which is pretty spectacular. So it kind of set the set, set the standard for going forwards. So yeah, I mean, I, I always tended to work quite quickly anyway in pre, you know, in my previous life. I, I did a lot of rap and hip hop acts who don't, you know, they're huge and don't give you a lot of time. So I was quite used to working quickly. And um, so it would be, you know, it would have been nice to be a lot more studious about working with them, but it just, it just doesn't work like that. Not, yeah, not in my experience anyway. So they, you know, they were, that, that being said, they were, they, you know, they were quite self-aware and Peter's always, Peter and Carl have always been quite fashion oriented, oriented, but it would, it would come together sometimes really like a scattergun. So, so they needed someone to kind of, you know, make it work together rather than look like four people from different bands yeah is. yeah yeah i mean yeah, I've, I've seen quotes from pete saying he would literally dress the band like yeah he told them all to wear leather jackets and stuff like that yeah yeah Bef before i was involved the the they basically um copied the strokes <laughs> yeah yeah and you know but it was a wise move you know and they they they, they, they you know they um they, they, their homage to the strokes was on a few levels but it was very much with their own take and and a very big sense of britishness about it um so i think the two coexist really nicely together no yeah definitely they pulled it off for sure um yeah. is that a band you've worked with before i shot them live a few times met them a few times and i shot them for the for the enemy cover for for the uh brat awards that it was it was the strokes with carly minogue oh, okay Interesting. Um, which is your favourite Libertines cover out of Interesting? Do you have one? Um, it, probably from the second album, just because it was such a rigmarole to get it go, get get it all together. Um, literally camping outside Peter's flat for four hours, <laughs> knocking on his door, trying to get him to approve it. Yeah, fair. And then moving into album covers, then obviously the famous uh, second album cover at the Tap and Tin. Did you expect that to be as iconic as it was? No, no, not at all. I mean, I knew that there'd be something quite good that would come out of it, but not, yeah, not anything like that. Yeah. yeah. And what are your memories of that night, really? Obviously, it's gone down in, in folklore kind of thing. Oh yeah, it was. I mean, it was incredible. It was really emotional. I'd I'd gone to the prison with Carl in the morning to meet Peter, and and then just left them to their own devices for, for a few hours. Carl was horribly drunk by the time I, I met up with him later. I think you know because of the nerves and everything, he'd just been drinking all day. And um, yeah, it was one of the best shows I've ever been to, without a doubt. Just so so joyful yeah yeah we had spoke to dean fragile recently uh about the gig and it's interesting because i was asking him about early baby shambles and you've posted some recent uh pictures from early baby shambles gigs yeah and he was kind of uh he was mixed about that whole time he says it was like he didn't he doesn't look back on it massively fondly he you know he wanted liberties to stay together like what do you remember from that time well yeah i mean it, it... Obviously, everyone wanted them to stay together, but the circumstances were so terrible. I mean, everything that happened was just diabolical, really. Um, and the reactions to it were diabolical. And um, for them to have stayed together under those circumstances would have been catastrophic so it was the 
the lesser of many evils, the band splitting up and forming other bands, and you know, at least they're still alive. Um, mm. Just about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an exciting time to look back on mm. some of those like Baby Shambles gigs, really good kind of thing. Um, and then the idea for the book, re really, with Anthony Thornton, was that um, was that a bit of a no-brainer when you got together type thing? Yeah, I mean, Anthony and I had been around almost as long as each other, you know, around the the lips scene or whatever you want to call it. And um, I can't, you know, what I can't even remember ever having a conversation about. Let's do a book, but I think we must have done it. But like you say, I think it was just a no-brainer. We've got to do something that that um, covers the whole thing, and it was so egalitarian, you know, the idea to do something with equal pictures and words. It. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a little uh, pool of joy in the in the middle of <laughs> sort of horror. <laughs> yeah, fair. And I imagine like enemy at that point, which was it an exciting place to be, like in and around the offices, or you're not really. No, no, it was. It, it was definitely. Um, I mean, obviously, they by that stage. I mean, there were lots of things going on at enemy at that at that point that made it a little bit uncomfortable they were trying to make and they succeeded in making um, most of the photographers sign really draconian contracts and sign away all the rights to their photographs and all these sorts of things and for no fucking use either because you know enemy doesn't really exist anymore so what was the point of that um but anyway sorry um <laughs> so they, they would they would wheel me out to do libertine stuff because they knew that no one else would really get anything and that was great because, the, you know, there was obviously a lot of mileage in that. But it was, yeah, it was a bit of sweet thing, really, because I found Enemy at that point it was just awful. All right. Okay. Yeah, because I was watching, I watched a documentary involved in um, Music <laughs> Through the Lens. And I was watching a clip from it today where someone was saying, one of the photographers was saying, you know, never, never sign away the copyright type thing. Is it's, that usually the rule of thumb? It's, it should be, yeah, because in our, you know, your your archive as a photographer should, is your, is effectively your pension. Most most creatives don't end up, you know, putting money into pension plans and all that unless you're ranking or something. You know, you don't get enough money to do that. So um, your archive is your is your um, is your pension. But a lot of the magazines in the in the noughties started land grabbing rights and. And and some bands even did it as well. Stone Roses, for fuck's sake, did it. Um, you know, and to this day, they, they, there are bands that will won't let you in the pit if you're doing a live shot unless you you have you sign over the rights to those photos to that band, which I just think is diabolical. I mean, it's easy for me to say, but I would just say I would just not work with a with a band that did that. It's just criminal. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um... And yeah, just at what point did you transition into being a bit of a director then? It was around the when the band reformed. I was always interested and I did actually do a really brief stint, although nothing ever came of it, like in, in the very early noughties with, I did some video with Coldplay and stuff, but I literally like couldn't, I didn't like the technology back then. It was so difficult to, to, compared to how it is now so I just stopped um but yeah when the band reformed there was interest in the documentary and it was just seemed like the management just said we can't imagine sort of letting anyone in else in at this stage it would be really difficult so would you do it and I, I said yes thank you I will give it a go <laughs> um, Literally, I think it was like within two weeks we had to start. So there was very much kind of learning on the fly. And the first couple of things I shot were really bad. Um, um, like, you know, all the settings wrong on the camera and things like that. But but we got there in the end. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I mean, did, go on, sorry. So no, I was, I was just going to say, and then I, event, you know, inevitably started doing music videos and um, really enjoyed that. But it's like anything, you know, you can burn out. I mean, I love trampoline, but I've done 26 videos for trampoline. Right. Which, which has got to be some kind of record for me. <laughs> um, and I would always work with them. Don't get me wrong, but but it's so easy to burn out. And especially yeah. got my brain. <laughs> it's really easy. 
how does it work with videos and is it sometimes your idea sometimes the band idea to kind of work together on that kind of thing ideally i like collaborating with people um rather than sort of you know saying right it's going to be a um it's going to be set in the future and um the robots are taking over the world it's no, no i'd rather work with someone and you know, have a meeting of minds. I mean, I did a few videos with Baxter Jury and that's how we always worked. It was always just me and him. Ne never had a, any other crew even, really. And um, and we just sort of thrash out ideas and and get somewhere loose, shoot, and then thrash it out a bit more. That was all, it's, it's always the fun when you work with somebody. I don't like, in fact, I rarely, if, it, if I get asked to put a treatment in for something, I rarely do it because I just find it either you want me to work for you or you don't you've you know there's enough of my stuff out there if you like it then let's go for it um I'm not gonna it's not that I don't like competing or anything it's just I'd rather work with someone from the start yeah you don't have to like pitch for a job type thing yeah yeah I know it's, it's interesting one of your comments about the Gunga Din video with Libertines. Just uh, there was a quote from um, the director of photography saying it was the most most insane production he'd ever done. But you were like, well, it's just the Libertines. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad though. Yeah, there was, it's, I mean, that was a really professional production company that we had as well. I remember doing the one after that, the Heart of the Matter, and um, the producer literally said we've got to shut this down we've got to shut this down this because he thought that peter was going to really you know in, there's a scene where he holds a um a syringe to the guy's neck the producer genuinely thought that he was going to inject him in the in the neck i was like what the fuck are you talking about why he's not <laughs> he's not an absolute crazed madman he's not going to inject whatever the fuck was in that syringe into this guy's neck i think it was tea or something so. <laughs> yeah and then I just want to talk a bit more about um, knowing some bystanders. Like, just interested in, did you conduct a lot of the interviews then for that? Which, sorry? For uh, knowing some bystanders. Um, were you the one conducting a lot of the interviews? So for that, there was, um, I was doing the interviews pretty, yeah. Um, but I had a really good friend of mine, David Stand, and, then a, a, and a cameraman a lot of the time or a documentary filmmaker called uh, Christian Brown. And it was basically the three of us um, on set most of the time. Um, very small, like, and none of us were really, like David's a producer, Christian is an editor really, and he edited most of the film. Um, so none of us were really, this wasn't like our prime job, do you know what I mean? So it, we again, it was, we were all learning on the fly. So it's just, it was so difficult to get anybody else around them and anyone else that would be prepared to be around them, you know, given the sort of things that went on previous, you know, there were people that literally just wouldn't want to, didn't want to get involved. It's weird now. And then you see things like Louis Theroux and stuff. And, and, um, but back then it was, you know, because Peter was, you know, injecting whenever the fuck he wanted to, you know, which is what you do when you're an addict. Um, people, you know, quite understandably didn't want to be around that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I was watching it earlier today and this week and uh, yeah, the interviews with Carla are really interesting. Um, like, is it quite hard to get them that relaxed or do you have that relationship at that point where he knew he could trust you type thing? I mean, with, with Carl, I was probably closer with Carl from the start. So that was, that was easier. And, and I kind of knew a lot of the backstory. I mean, it's by no means perfect or anything that that film there's, there's a, I would do it differently now for instance you know but um the thing I didn't want was just loads of talking heads just loads of random journos and stuff chipping in their opinions I just wanted it to be the band really um but we were still at a point where it was you were either, either with Peter or you were with Carl and Peter thought that I was just with Carl so he didn't really engage with the film as much as we wanted to. Plus, he was going through a really bad time with his with his illness, so um, that made it harder as well. Yeah, was that the time when they had like separate um, tar bosses and stuff? That yeah, it was. Yeah, that's pretty wild, isn't it? 
<laughs> um, well, in fact, I don't think. Um, I mean, at one point we did we 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 got to Leeds Festival in four separate tour buses, which none of the band could use because they had their kids with them and they weren't sure to take kids on. Oh so wow! Four pretty much empty tour buses. <laughs> I know, like, you hear them talk about it now. I think Pete's made a reference to, like, how many people made money off that initial reunion. It seems like yeah. a pretty wild production, yeah. The problem is that, and I can't blame anyone for this because it's just the way it was, but people were a bit afraid of Peter and afraid to... And I'm not talking about the band. I'm talking about management and and people around. They they not afraid. They were fearful that something would go wrong, so they they tried to set it up so that to minimize that as much as possible but it was i think if we'd sat down and and talked and thought about it a bit better then people have realized that nothing bad was going to happen really people might be late but that's just par for the course you know it wasn't da- it wasn't going to be dangerous and horrible it was just going to be a bit shambolic or disorganized but yeah, yeah. a lot of money was wasted I mean, yeah, there's obviously moments in the film where Pete doesn't turn up to rehearsals and stuff. Was there any moments where he thought it wasn't going to happen, or do you just think, oh, that's, you're like you say, it's par for the course? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there was a, ever any real worry that it wasn't going to happen. It was just a bit of a shame, I think, that um, in terms of how it affected relationships and things like that. Um, the the fear and the miscommunication and uh, and you know the three of them three of the you know the other three as it were being sat around twiddling twiddling their thumbs that you know and and not wanting to get angry about it and you know doing their best not to get angry about it but but you know what you know, what other reaction are you going to have yeah yeah and objectively now looking back it looks like the best gig was probably the um... The initial one at Kentish Town Forum was that same for you? It's funny. I don't really remember them in chronological order anymore. The the Leeds gig was amazing. Yeah, I was at that one actually. Yeah, yeah. that for me was more fun than Reading. Partly in what way? Just because they were a bit looser at that point. Not so much loose. I think they'd all slept. That was <laughs> right. Okay. Um. And it was the first big show. I mean, the forums, the forum ones were great, but th- that was the first big show. But it's funny. It, it's funny it's t- until you said that. I didn't mind that the forum shows were after that. That <laughs> goes out, goes to show how un- unreliable my memory is. <laughs> but they were great. Don't get me wrong. They were great. Yeah, yeah. And how did they compare? Can you compare them to the early shows, or is it just like a I different think they time? Compare, right? really, no, they compare really favourably. I think. Um, and this isn't, you know, casting aspersions at all. Much more favourably, I'd say, than recent shows. They're a different band now. Mm. Um, I think it's this isn't a good thing, obviously, but I think because of the kind of weirdness and the sort of strained relations and stuff like that, that's why they they would compare to the early shows. Whereas now there's a lot more harmony. Since the second album... You know, there's sorry, not second album, third album. Um, there's a lot more harmony in the band, so things are a lot, um, a lot easier in that respect. But that definitely wasn't the, t- the what it was like when they first reformed. So it did kind of felt it felt like we were just carrying on. Yeah, yeah. And the name of that film does it come from that photo you took of the band where it's got that graffiti in the background? Yeah. That's like a uh, happy accident type thing. Um. That we were gonna we we were gonna use that in the film anyway, and it and it just seemed like, yeah, it just I, and I, that is a Burroughs quote, and I always remember it being really resonant with, especially around the time Peter got chucked out of the band and things like that. It it just it just always resonated, so it seemed like a really natural title to have. Yeah, that's good. And then I saw a quote saying there was a flag that. Um... Your girlfriend did uh, meticulously prepared. What did it actually say on the flag? Uh, Dulce decorum est, I think. 
Uh, okay. Which is from a World War One poem. I think it starts with the core of it. Uh, um, it's which just means something like it's proper and right. So the idea being that you know it's proper and right that they um, that they're here to get here together again. Yeah, but that didn't stay around for long, Peter Nick. That. <laughs> that's where that is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you ended up doing the actual uh, third album cover a bit last minute. Is that right? It was. It was last minute in terms of when we shot it. Yeah. It wasn't last minute in terms of when we meant to shoot it. Okay, right. Because um, I I was originally employed to go out to Thailand for two weeks at the beginning of the session and then one week at the end. And I ended up staying the entire time because we hadn't got what we, what we needed. Um, and I think we got that literally on the last day. Okay, cool. I don't think Peter had slept for four days or something. I mean, he was literally seeing people floating in the air and all kinds of weird shit i don't know Blimey. yeah have you done many other album covers or um I, you know i have but but not for quite as significant artists um and i couldn't actually tell you oh paddington's i did one of their record covers oh really oh the f- first one's first yeah oh, okay yes. uh, and that, i didn't mean by not as significant in reference to the Paddingtons, I think love, I'll say that. Love, love the Paddingtons, um, but it's it's funny. I'm not one of these people that kind of chalks off covers and things like that. I've got I've got somewhere like a a, a box full of stuff like that, but it's um, it's really about the images themselves, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll appreciate your time, Roger. We'll move on to the uh, fan questions. Um, just before we do, actually, I just wanted to ask. About the Eminem picture, what was it like working with him? <laughs> oh, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, hilarious. He was like just at the crest of that madness, fame wave, you know. Yeah, he was just brilliant, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did like the crowds differ with different kind of scenes as well? Obviously, it's a more get more obsessive for different ones type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't say so much for him on that tour because that was on the Vans Warp tour, so it was kind of you get kind of a mad weird metal crowd type uh, or punk metal crowd on those tours um but yeah yeah the yeah some 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 of the hip-hop crowds can be a little bit um uh, a little less friendly let's say than the, <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, especially, cool. especially if you're pushing pushing your way to the front of a gig you know understandably i would get pissed off <laughs> all right cool well first one is from bobby needs who says um what happened to your coffee table photography book that was due out this year via the snap galleries um just never got round to it i got so um we, it, we will get there we will get there i am um, i got i ended up having to put put off a couple of exams with my university course um for personal reasons um so yeah that's what that's what happened to that, I'm afraid. But it, but we will get there. Have you thought about doing like a, a book in general, like a more of an autobiography type thing? People have mentioned that. It's, I don't know. I can. I don't feel like I've had that that kind of weird, interesting a life, um, and I can't remember all of it. So <laughs> uh, maybe maybe before before the before the memory goes. <laughs> yeah, if we have another lockdown. Yeah. Um. Okay, Carl Barat News on Instagram says, when is he going to let us see the decades worth of the Libertines and Dirty Pretty Things photos he took? I suppose they mean maybe the unseen ones, I don't know. Well, there's, I mean, I've got so much. It's funny, my Libertines archive is pretty huge. Um, my Dirty Pretty Things archive is enormous. <laughs> um, it would be fun. I, I didn't get to see, unfortunately, I didn't get to see their show when they reformed really wanted to i had such fun shooting them and they were they were great and um i've got some fantastic stuff so i'm gonna i am gonna put some out on the on the instagram anyway i'm just trying it's funny with the instagram i'm just really enjoying like just putting live stuff up at the moment for some reason i'm just really really enjoying that because it's making me look for stuff that i wouldn't normally look for 
and I've got to scan a hell of a lot of stuff in as well. I've got um, 20, 30 litre boxes of negatives, um, probably half of which haven't been scanned yet. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, from Count the Embers, any updates on the 1001 Candles concert recording? Are you still working on it? Uh, might have to avoid this one for leaving. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, to be honest. It was a, it was a show they did at Shepherd's, uh, Shep, not Shepherd's Bush, Hackney Empire. Uh, okay, right. Yeah, there was some uh, nothing to do with the band, but the, the, yeah, there was some discrepancies about finances with that. Right. Okay. We'll move on then. Um, Answered one from Adam Morissotti about how did the Bound Together book come about. Um, Marta from Arcadia says, can you please release some more behind the scenes Libertines pictures? And also, can you elaborate on your quote where you said that Peter and Carl should get a room? <laughs> um, in answer to the first question, um, yes. I'll, I, um, as soon as I've got a few more live pictures out of the way i'm going to start doing behind, like backstage pictures because i've never really put any of those out um and that, so i'm going to work my way back from live to backstage and then to to post stuff again because like i say i'm finding some really interesting stuff that i haven't looked at for years with the you know going through the live stuff so yeah i will that and to get a room just google it <laughs> Fair play. um Barton underscore Paul 22 says, are you proud of how there are no innocent bystanders turned out? Proud isn't really the right word. I, like I said, I would have done it differently now. I'd have done it differently probably a year later. Um, you know, it's kind of beautiful, but flawed. Yeah. Um. I, Ian Gilbert says, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but will there ever be a chance the Libertines will tour the US? Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, I sort of know the answer to that, but I can't really talk about it on here. I, I, I think in the long run, yes, but there's some work to be done first. Yeah, yeah. Can imagine with visas and the like. Yeah. Um, Brad Jack says, which artist has been the most fun to shoot with so far? Can you pin it down to one? I mean, I'd probably have to say Libertines just because it, it was a lot of fun. Um, but there was also a lot of mi misery as well. Yeah. Um, and there's probably some band that I don't even remember that I just had a brilliant day with, but Christ knows if, who the hell that is now. Um, but yeah, let's just say Libertines for that, for that point of view. Well, and Dirty Pretty Things, that was always a lot of fun. Did anyone surprise you in terms of how like affable they were or whatever, or when if they had a certain reputation beforehand? I think a lot of the a lot of the hip hop stars I worked with, um, Snoop Dogg was one of the loveliest, sweetest people I've ever met. Um Eminem is similar, Ice T. Um, ACDC, really, really good fun. Um, like Paul, oh, yeah. Paul Weller is like one of the ni nicest people I've worked with as well, and a massive hero of mine. So I was really nervous meeting him, but he was just so down to earth. Um, you know, there, uh, there are a few people that are absolute arseholes as well. <laughs> I don't tend to work with people like that more than once. Yeah. That's funny. I saw your comment about the ACDC shoot because you said uh, how much fun they were to work with. And he said that uh, indie dull ads take note or something. That was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get some people taking themselves a bit seriously type thing. Yeah. Obviously. And that's the thing. When you, when you see someone that's been around that long, that is still kind of interesting fun engaging and so on it just makes makes you realize you know don't stop being so precious so early just get on with it <laughs> and last few questions uh, one from wichita records saying 
why are you more rock and roll than anyone you've ever photographed? <laughs> uh, that's really funny. Thanks. I know who that is. <laughs> um, it's because I got taught by him. <laughs> uh, Ollie Burden says, can you tell when you've captured a classic shot or only find out when you go through them afterwards? Sometimes you get an inkling, but but sometimes... I mean, if it's like a structured shoot, but like that that Libs cover, didn't think that shot was going to be anything. I only got two frames of that, and one of them, they've both got their eyes shut, and it's like twisted around like that. I might stick that up one day, actually, just to show how how random that was. Yes. Was, it, was there a bit of a mixed reaction to that, obviously, with, uh, I don't know. Well, that, that, that picture got, kind of slipped under the radar a couple of times. It was only when... Rough Trade asked me to get together a few images that might make a record cover, and I actually cropped it into a into a square that we started looking at it slightly differently, really. Yeah, but in terms of like, oh, the I see drug, the drug looks, links. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't think, if I'm honest, I don't think Peter likes it, or if he does now, then he certainly didn't for a long time because of that, because it made made him look like a junkie. But that really wasn't the the intention. I mean, I see it now, but it really wasn't the intention. Yeah, I think most people who knew the band knew it was because of the tattoos, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, then Marv from the Paddingtons, who we mentioned, he says, oh, uh, he says, hi, first of all. And then he <laughs> says, just says, talk about Prince. <laughs> um, <I> would... <laughs> Everyone's going to hate me for this. Uh, I'm not really a Prince fan. <laughs> Um, I like a couple of songs, but yeah, that that's not a popular thing to say. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, was it just live photos you did with him, or was it more? It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, incredible showman and and all that. And I think from that gig, that's the best picture that anyone got. And I don't usually sort of blow up my own stuff like that, but I I really love that picture. And then. Yeah, is there anything you do differently from your career, do you think? Um, I mean, God, yes. There's lots of things I'd do differently and there, there isn't enough time left on this to to do it. But I think, conf, you know, I, I struggled with confidence a hell of a lot from all, you know, from, from right, right from the beginning. And I think if... If I could have changed one big thing, that it would have it would have been to work on my confidence and being more self assured because that that handicapped me quite a lot. To you know, there's from doing certain things and embracing certain situations, definitely. All but right, a bit of a glum way to end, but it's but it is true. No, it's interesting because obviously, like the relationships you've built, you know, people have obviously took to you. So is it just kind of in, in terms of opportunities? You mean? Yeah, I turned down a Rolling Stone, a Rolling Stone gig, you know things like that. Okay, Rolling Stones gig, sorry. Um, I think just things like that. Just um, yeah, ne never been the greatest self promoter as well, and um, I think yeah, just sort of being being a lot a bit more self assured in certain situations would have would have really helped, definitely. Okay, well let's finish on a good one then. There. <laughs> Is there a high point from your career, would you say? You can pick multiple ones, I suppose. I think, I don't know about career, but in terms of my my experience of my own career, um, would definitely be, you know, the early days Libertine stuff. That was, that was very exciting. Very yeah. close, followed by, you know, the Oasis in the in the 90s definitely yeah so for the benefit of people listening and watching on youtube after our initial chat i realized there were um it's quite a bit of extra information on the snap galleries and one picture i came across of um pete and carl meeting up in 2005 because i didn't even realize this had happened so can you tell us a bit about what happened there yeah um so i think they they had a really brief meeting um like for the very first time at the Dublin Castle I believe 
but the the idea was to to get together again and um it was it was hard i think well it was hard getting them both in the same room at the same time but i think carl felt a little bit exposed so he asked me to come along um and not not like you know for like physical support or anything like that but just just for a you know to have a mate there basically and um and it, and i know it sounds it may sound a bit weird but i just thought it it probably best just to fall into old ways which would be to have my camera with me and to carry on because they never really bothered you know I, whether they whether or not they you know notice me or not it, they just they were always natural so there was never really situations that i didn't feel i could take photos of and um it almost just felt normal and so that the best way to be would be normal so i had my camera with me the only odd thing about it was that kate was there and um it's a very strange woman um she so this this sort of moment happens with peter and carl and i'm taking photos and i don't feel like i'm intruding i honestly don't if i thought i was i wouldn't have done i wouldn't have taken pictures and then she just sort of plonks herself down next to him no. and, and says don't take no. oh, sorry my dog's barking and okay. says, don't take pictures of me so i just said well don't sit there then <laughs> and then um spent most of the rest of the evening making very thinly veiled threats about what? about what she'd done to other photographers and i was and i was the whole time just going what are you trying to say why are you trying <laughs> to say that you've got nothing I, look i don't what? give a shit if you're here or not i've absolutely no interest in you whatsoever <laughs> oh sorry one second. it's all right Shush. Shush. Yeah, I, I've got absolutely no interest in you whatsoever. I, you know, I didn't say it in a horrible way, but I just said I'd prefer it if you weren't here, to be honest. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was just really weird. Really, you know, like don't take my don't take my picture, but I'm going to sit right here at the <laughs> picture. Yeah, it's exactly. like so there were a lot of people that did try and insert themselves into history. Or history, sorry, it sounds a bit conceited, but you know, do you know what I mean? Like, try to try to insert themselves into moments that might have possibly been, you know, important in the later day. You know, no, I can imagine that, yeah. And I mean, this website's really interesting. Um, but in terms of that meeting, though, were they just meeting up as mates, trying to like, you know, keep well, that connection? To, yeah, trying to heal their very very bro oh. broken relationship oh. at that time yeah yeah okay and then yeah another picture just quickly wanted to mention um the brick lane photo again because i read that it might be it that graffiti might have been done by banksy is that right no it was banksy ah right okay so that's interesting Missed that yeah I, I i only have a vague recollection of um it was kind of weird back then I only have a vague recollection of someone saying on the day that that was banksy but that definitely wasn't the reason that we did it back then he wasn't that famous and I remember, like, I sort of heard of him, but I, you know, he was no, none of the gravitas that he has now. And I remember doing a, a photo shoot with the others. Remember the others? Yeah, yeah. And um, you could barely walk around the East End of London without sort of falling over a bit of Banksy art. And, um, and, and they being like, oh, no, can we not do a picture there? Because there's a Banksy on the wall. <laughs> and um, it's, it's kind of weird how things change, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's just it was just a cool quote. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a nice it's a nice um, twist of fate that it had turned out to be a Banksy because I you know I do like it and uh, yeah it's kind of kind of nice. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, apparently he's, hasn't his name been revealed or something recently? Did you read that? I haven't. Yeah, I've, it, very possibly I've not kept up with that. Apparently, like I was, you know, I met him once, but I don't remember. All right, okay. Um, and yeah, I just read that you actually paid for your own flight to America to see the Libertines, and that was the only band you'd done that for. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it was um, again, you know, in retrospect, it's uh, it seems a bit weird to 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 say this, but I really wanted to go out to America to see them. 
you know, on their first tour. And with every other band that I, you know, <sighs> this this doesn't, I don't mean this to sound unkind, but, you know, they they sent people out when Smash and these animal men went to New York, um, but they wouldn't, they weren't, they weren't going to send anyone for the Libertines. And I just thought that was criminal. So like Rough Trade helped me, they, they, they sort of threw a little bit of work my way if I was going to go there. Um, I mean, the enemy weren't um, averse to it, but they would, I think they would, they, you know, they were like, oh, if you if you see one of the gigs, we'll we'll give you a live review or something like that. So I just thought, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to go. It's too important not to. Um, yeah, and I'm obviously really glad I did because yeah, it yeah. to be the very last tour they ever did, like proper tour, you know, in, in the States. Yeah, yeah. And with quite a few of them, it says, um, you know, the pictures were shelved for whatever reason for years in some cases, even like the Red Guards jacket one. Um, what was that about? Well, again, I mean, you know, I worked through the Britpop days and stuff, and I, and so, but I, even I was sort of unaware of menswear doing, using Red Guard jackets in one of their photos until afterwards really but a lot of people just discounted that as a reason not to use those pictures it's weird like you can't imagine that now like it's, if if something looks good and works you just you just go for it don't you but for some reason there was a there was still a lot of second guessing going on like oh you can't do that because people will think this mm. no one cared 90% <laughs> of people, no offense to menswear, had never heard of menswear. It was just about that kind of little bubble that the that, that the media lives in. No one no one gave a shit, really. Yeah, yeah. Was that it's, a management thing then? Um no, it wasn't a management thing. Banny Banny was managing them then and she was like she was brilliant. She was like yeah, you know, she was slightly crazy, but she was brilliant. She was you know, such a sort of um, inspirational force in nature and stuff. So, so she, you know, she helped out with the shoot. She, you know, she was she was great. So, yeah, and it was more, it was more kind of, um, I guess, not. You know, maybe people. At the, I can't remember exactly. Maybe people at the label. Maybe maybe Tony the PR. I'm not sure. It it very much came from a back, you know, a backseat kind of way. Oh, okay, right. And then just one more question, sorry, Matt. Um, just one of the photos kind of shows you the work that goes into it. There's one where it said uh, you've had a full day of shooting and it felt like you've got nothing and that the, and that the expectations have been high. Um, that like, yeah, what? How? Why did that not meet the mark? Do you think? Oh right, yeah. So the so so just just for the sake of um, confusion, um, that's not the the photos that I'm talking that I'm referring to you, you uh, get okay all right so so this was the although yeah it kind of reads like that um so the first shoot we did and there are some pictures out there from that um it they, like I say there they they kind of they all wore different clothes they look like four people from four different bands it was their first proper shoot, so it's understandable. But it's weird going back to those pictures now. There are some, there are some absolute gems, and and um, but it it was it's it it's kind of inevitable when when bands first start out. They they need a bit of time to to get used to themselves and work out what they are and and who they are. So this was the second shoot a couple of weeks later, and we had better ideas of what what was going to work. And and I'm I'm a big fan of uniformity and making people feel like they belong together and that's what we aim for with this so hence the kind of leather jackets and um i mean what one of them isn't well i think like john's wearing um tony's jacket just so that we could get them looking a bit more cohesive you know okay that's interesting all right well what we'll do a full podcast again don't worry <laughs> um so just to finish off, just wondered if you did have an Oasis story. No worries if not. I only saw that just just when you um, just when you uh, uh, sorry when I read that email. The only thing I can just vaguely remember was, and it's not a brilliant story, but it's just the first time I saw them at that um, 
at that uh, uh, water rat show. And I was right at the front the whole time. Uh, and I got that picture with Liam looking into the camera. And um, it was impressive, you know, it was the it was the first sort of impressive band I'd seen for a long time. But I just always remember when when he, when the show finished, I don't know if you've ever been to the Water Rats, but the stage is probably about, I don't know, 10 centimetres high. It's not very big. Liam just sort of stepped off and sh shoulder barged me out of the way and walked off. And it was the first time I just thought, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Like yeah, it wasn't lean or anything, it was just announcing his presence, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah.